Welcome to New View Advice. I'm your host, Amanda DeRocher, and I invite you to join me here each week as I offer advice on how to move through whatever problem or trauma is holding you back from living life to the fullest. Let's get started. Hey, beautiful soul. My name is Amanda DeRocher, and this is New View Advice. If you're new here, this is a healing-centered advice podcast where I offer guidance for the healing journey. I don't believe I have all the answers you seek. I believe you have all the answers. You just may need a new view and a little help along the way. Thanks for joining me for today's episode. Today we are talking about self-trust, how to develop self-trust, how it can be hard to trust ourselves, and all things trust and intuition. I'm especially excited for today's episode because I am joined by guest Erica Warnick. Erica is one of my closest friends, and Erica and I talk about how hard it is to trust ourselves all the time. So I thought we were a great combo for this episode because our lives are different and our work is different, but also it's very similar that we are always following our heart and connecting back to our intuition and trusting ourselves even before it's logical. And I've spoken with a lot of people recently about this. How do we learn to trust ourselves? And because of that, I wanted to record an episode with Erica. And so I thought Erica was such a great guest for this. Erica is known as Hollywood Success Coach, and she helps artists create success in one of the most impossible industries so they can live the life they've always dreamed of. After breaking into Hollywood with no connections and booking her first TV show just two weeks after moving to LA, Erica has spent over a decade living her dream designing graphics for television. You can see her work on hit shows like Glee, Superstore, and most recently, This Is Us. She's a best-selling author of Men For This, The Mindset and Strategy to Achieve Your Most Impossible Dreams, and Erica has developed a reputation for helping people access their inner greatness and achieve the goals that used to feel out of reach. Between herself and her clients, they've booked work on over 60 television shows and films on Netflix, Hulu, HBO, Fox, NBC, and CBS, just to name a few. Erica's debut TV special will be streaming worldwide soon. So as you can tell from Erica's amazing bio, she has had a long career in achieving things that most people would say are impossible, and that has involved a lot of self-trust. So I'm really excited for today's episode. I think it's a great interview, and I'm excited for you to hear it. So before we jump in, I always like to mention that if you're interested in free resources for the healing journey, I invite you to check out newviewadvice.com, where I have journal prompts and meditations and more to assist you in healing. And today's episode show notes will be at newviewadvice.com slash 102. And in the show notes, I'll link Erica's book as well as how you can reach her and connect more with her after this episode. So with that, let's jump on into talking about self-trust. Hi, Erica. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Today, we're going to talk about self-trust. And I wanted Erica to be here to help talk about self-trust because Erica recently filmed a TV special. And we've talked so much about how trusting yourself, trusting your intuition, following your heart was such a big part of that process. So I was hoping you could talk to us and tell everybody a bit about your TV special and what that process was like and how your intuition played a role there. You know, it's so funny. You, you start saying that. I'm like, I shouldn't talk about self-trust. I'm still really struggling with it. And it reminds me, I don't know if you watched The Good Place, but there's this scene in The Good Place where... Eleanor, Kristen Bell's character, is like, I, I I shouldn't be doing this. I'm just a girl from Arizona. And Ted Danson's character is like, that's exactly why we need you. We need a girl from Arizona. And <laughs> it's just, <laughs> so that's why we need you to talk about self-trust, Erica, because you're struggling with it. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, when you said that, I was like, that's why you're here, because we both struggle with it, but we do the things anyways, and that's what people need to hear. So I was like, no, you're the perfect person. <laughs> I, I will say, like, I feel like I have grown a lot, and I feel like I've come a long way, but I am definitely not an expert in being like, I absolutely trust myself, I never question anything, and I am perfect. <laughs> I don't know if you ever get there, you know? That's my wonder at this point is if it ever feels perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, I've had, I'm on now, I'd like to say my third career, <laughs> essentially, but it, it's all the same, but I'm doing different things. And I think I've learned as I go into each new career or each new big dream, you know, new stuff comes up, it comes up in new ways. There's always growth that has to happen. So yeah, I would agree. I don't, I don't think there's really ever a time where you're like, I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, because I think that because I was thinking about this today, because a lot of people will tell me how they don't like to do hard things, or why is it so hard? And I feel like we need to reframe our relationship with hard, like hard is 
I love hard at this point. It shows me my growth edge. And that's why I think it falls into self-trust. When you're going for a new dream, you're going for a new growth edge. You know, you're going to have that doubt arise. And I think it gets easier because you learn your own signals and stuff. You know, like we were talking about before this, like for me, like when anger arises, it's trying to communicate with me. I usually try to shove it down, but it's just a communicator and I listen to it quicker and quicker, but it's uncomfortable. So it's not like I'm immediately like, oh, let's sit with this anger and let's see what's up. It's like, mm, I'll do that later. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been a very interesting journey for me, for sure. And actually, before I really say anything, I'm curious and maybe just for people listening, like how would you define trusting yourself? What does that mean to you? That's a great question. I would define it as following your heart, as cheesy as it sounds. It's like when you trust yourself, you're following that inner compass. You're following your intuition. You're following your inner guidance. And so often the outside world is going to send you opposite messages. So that self-trust is knowing that like, I got my back. I'm following this. I trust myself that this, whatever this step is, or this dream is, is leading me towards whatever you set your intention for. You know, mine's like always just like highest timeline. Like, show me how big I can be. Show me how much power I can embody. And that feels like arrogant to say, but as somebody who felt like all their power was taken, it's a word that resonates for me. Everybody's going to have a different intention though. So I feel like for me, trust is like trusting that those steps I get and those intuitive hits are leading me towards that intention. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think my two biggest obstacles that maybe help define this for me is trusting myself in relation to what other people tell me. For example, when I got the idea to film a TV special, people were like, oh, you're not ready for that. Oh, maybe you should try something on a much smaller scale. You know, um, oh, you're not super famous yet. So that's one of my biggest obstacles is when I feel these intuitive hits and then the outside world is like, no, 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 you're wrong. And the other obstacle I have, which is maybe even bigger, because when people tell me I can't, I'm like, oh, you, you watch, you, you see, I'm going to do it, you know. But the other biggest obstacle is trusting without proof. And I feel like that has been one of my biggest things to learn over the past couple of years, because that, that quote from Osho, I don't know if I say his name right, but he talks about intuition where he says, your ego is like, well, if I can't prove it, then I don't believe it or that I won't accept it. If I can't prove it, I won't accept it. So for example, with the TV special, can I prove to these people that I'm ready to do this TV special? Well, not unless I actually go do the thing, right? But that's like going to take a year. So there's like a whole entire year where I don't have physical proof yet and I'm still choosing to move forward with it and I'm still choosing to work through it. And that's been really hard. The whole, you know, intuition versus ego thing with trusting yourself is what I have learned is that my intuition will lead me to things that don't make sense, that don't make logical sense. And, you know, Asho says that that's kind of like point, right? Like our intuition cannot be explained and our ego brain wants it to be explained. So if my intuition is saying, Erica, I think you should film a TV special for your next thing. My ego is like, are you crazy? What? No, 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 no. And my intuition, I have this like knowing that it's going to be okay. I mean, it's going to be a, a risk and it's going to be scary. But I have this knowing that it's going to be okay, but there's nothing logical about that decision. And so it's like this constant battle of trusting the guidance that I feel guided to do versus my logical brain, my ego brain that's like, there is nothing logical about this. So maybe you shouldn't trust it. I love that you brought that up because I think that's such a big part of following your intuition is that that ego mind is always going to come in because I think it does with like, the egos often there to keep you safe. So anything new and scary and change feels unsafe. It's learning how to sort of befriend it and learn how to learn how to like talk it off a ledge. That's how I always feel like with my ego is I'm always learning how to be like, okay, let's take a few steps back. Let's calm down. <laughs> let's reevaluate together. <laughs> yes, ego, this is terrifying. We're going to have to do it anyway. You know, but I think that so many people, at least that I talk to, think that that voice won't be there. And I've just found through my experience that like, the voice is always there, both voices, you know, and I just find the intuitive voice starts to get louder the more I listen to it. And it also starts to communicate through, like, for me, it's a lot of times through my body, through my heart space and my solar plexus is where I feel my intuition the most strongly. And everybody is going to be different. 
But it's only through continually following that that I can recognize those signs. But that other voice is always there as well. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is too woo, but I was doing tarot cards yesterday and I pulled, you know, I've really been struggling with this, what we're talking about. And the cards that came out was the High Priestess and the Fool. And there was one other card that came out. I forget which one that was like a success card. And the High Priestess is all about your intuition. And the Fool is like about new beginnings. But I was sitting there and for a moment I was like, wait a minute. They're telling me because I feel like a fool following this intuitive, you know, self-trust thing that doesn't make any sense. That's really scary that people don't get. And I feel like a fool following it. And so I have this moment where like, oh, they're not, they're not telling me that, you know, this is about new beginnings. It's okay to be foolish in the sense of trusting something that society doesn't tell you you should trust. Yes. I love that too, because I think that that's one of those fears. Feeling foolish falls into not being able to trust yourself. You're afraid you're going to like fall on your face or that you're going to be embarrassed or humiliated. Like you said, you kind of have a chip on your shoulder when people tell you like, you can't do something. And I listened to a podcast recently where somebody was saying, it's okay to have a couple chips on your shoulder, you know, if they keep you motivated. And I was like, yeah, okay. I have a couple chips too. But I think with that, it can be really scary to fail, the thought of failing. Cause you're like, oh, I'm going to prove those people right. But I think self-trust is knowing that it's about the journey, not the destination. No matter what, you'll learn something along the way. But that can be extremely hard for the ego to be like, what? It's just about the journey? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I have a new motto that I really need for myself where I say, Erica, it is not about proving them wrong. It is about showing them what's possible. Because, you know, there's a part of me that's like, oh, when I sell this special, you all, you'll all see, you'll all see how I was right and you were wrong and I can do this, you know, but I don't think that's really what I'm here to do, right? And that's all ego that, you know, there's nothing productive there. So for me, it's like, Erica, no, it's show them what's possible just by when, you, when I sell this special, it's going to show people that doubted it what's possible, not just for me, but for themselves. Because a lot of times when people doubt you, they're really doubting themselves. And so, if you feel like your intuition is leading you somewhere that a lot of people don't agree with or don't believe or, you know, don't know, it really says more about their own doubt in themselves. And so I'm really working on that, you know, trying to not let my ego take over and be like, see, I proved you all wrong, you know, because it's so much more important, I think, for me to show people what's really, truly possible because they're doubting me because they don't think something that quote unquote big or that's quote unquote exciting or cool or whatever. They, they don't think something that good could happen. And if I do it and if I show them, they might be like, oh, well, maybe I should try to go for something that I didn't think I could go for. You know, like that's what I'm hoping. Yeah, I love that reframe, you know, showing people what's possible. We've talked about it with my healing journey. One of the reasons I do what I do is because people told me it wouldn't be possible to heal from sexual assault and rape. Yeah, that wasn't an acceptable answer for me. But along the way, I 100% have doubted myself throughout the process. And I like to view it like you do, where one, you know, the more I heal, the more I show others that they can heal too. And that me healing makes other people have to look at their life in a different way. You know, and I think that's a reason people can doubt us is that they have a certain view of the world. They view the world through their lens and they don't want change, right? Their ego is probably running the show a bit more. And when people don't want change, they don't want to see other people do something that they've deemed impossible or deemed unnecessary. That's how I feel with my healing journey. A lot of people were like, you know, you just learn to live with it. And I was like, yeah, that's just not, that's not the case. I'm not going to do that. Because that to me felt like living like a victim for the rest of my life. Like, oh, just something happened to me and I just live with it. That just wasn't an appropriate answer. But I do see I trigger people. That can be hard. Again, with the hard, right? I think following our intuition can be hard. It can lead us to hard things. But it's not a bad thing to challenge other people's perceptions of the world. I think, unfortunately, we live in a world where so many people view the world in such a small lens. So we need people like you, you know, going after big dreams and showing people that it doesn't have to be that way. Totally. It's so similar, you know, not our experiences, but the way that we're talking about them, because I always say like big dreams trigger people. I had someone who I used to be friends with a long time ago, reach out to me a couple times privately 
once to tell me like not to try to sell my TV special because he didn't think it was going to happen and he just wanted to protect me from that failure and I should just put it on YouTube instead. And then, you know, I had enough of that. I was like, I ended up blocking him because it wasn't feeling good. And he got really upset about that and then told me my special stupid and it's never going to happen. And he just went off on me. And even though it's hurtful, I, I, I was like, I wonder what dream he put on the shelf. Why is this triggering him so much? Like, we haven't spoken in so long. Why are you coming at me to shit on my new dream that I'm working towards. And so people don't like to look inward, you know, they don't like to be that self aware. And, you know, now, I mean, I'm not perfect. <laughs> I still struggle. But now when something triggers me, I use it as an opportunity to look inward and become more self aware about something and be like, Oh, interesting. You know, that's how I was looking at this this whole time. But this kind of shakes that up. I wonder if I start looking at it differently. What, what does that look like? So yeah, the trigger piece, you know, it's like what you're talking about healing triggers, you know, it just, it's holding up a mirror to them, right? But reflecting back to them that their lives could be different. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like I'm, I'm living in my nice little bubble where I believe only one thing can happen or two things can happen. And now you're showing me that something else can, no, 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 get that out of here. Yeah. When you were talking, I was thinking about the one I hear a lot that you probably hear too with dreams is that people think that they're too old to do things. People think they're too old to heal. People think they're too old to change their lives. People think they're too old to start the business. And I'm sure you hear it with dreams. Are they too old to be an actor or a writer? And I find that one really interesting. I don't know why that came up while you were talking the age one, but I think it's just so common that, I don't know, it kind of makes me sad, to be honest, that people think because they're a certain age that they can't just start new, that they're just stuck like that. Because I believe life's all about changing and growing and learning. And I think I'll be changing till the day I die. What else am I here to do? I mean, there's nothing else. That's how I feel. There's nothing else to do besides new growth. But I think age can really stop people. And I also want to mention that too, because in a lot of my one-on-one -on -one sessions, people who are in their 20s are telling me they're too old to be doing things. And I'm like, sweethearts, I don't know who gave you that message. I'm so sorry. Because to me, I look at the 20s and I'm like, ah, oh, what a beautiful time of your life. And my 20s were traumatic as fuck. And I was like so unhappy and I was a drunk mess. And now I look back at them and I'm like, oh, what an age of exploration. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Taylor Tomlinson has a really great joke about that in her comedy specials where she's like, your 20s, you were thinner in your 20s. She's like, but that's why you didn't have a gut to work with. You, know, you weren't making good decisions because you didn't have a gut yet. You know, <laughs> she's like, it's just a time where you just make stupid decisions and no one expects anything of you. And yeah, I do not look back on my 20s fondly at all. And I just turned 40. Well, in December, <laughs> we're getting close to the six month mark. And I kind of feel like I'm just getting started. I feel like I've been led to this moment and I've really been cracked open and it's exciting and very scary to see where I'm going. But I do feel in a way like I'm just getting started. I love that. And I feel that way for you too. And I feel that way for me too. I'm just going to take a minute to do a shout out. Thank you for being my friend. Not many people have been through most of this journey with me. We both had tough years last year. Last year, I was isolated, like I literally isolated myself in the woods for a little too long, I think. I'm like coming back into society and I'm like, what is this? What have you guys all been doing? Yeah, no, I was isolated in my apartment. So similar, but <laughs> different. <laughs> yeah, last year, last year was really tough. And this year's like a hangover of it. So <laughs> yes, that's how I feel. I keep being like, I'm healing the PTSD of healing PTSD. <laughs> I have PTSD from last year. <laughs> it's a ripple effect. But I think that's important to note too, because I think life has so many ups and downs. You and I have had a lot of ups and downs. And we talk about how the hards can be really hard or the difficult, but it allows us those moments of joy and big dreams. I do think that there's a spectrum. And if you can feel the lowest of lows, you can feel the highest of highs. And I also think if you're willing to do hard things and trust yourself, because I think it can be hard, you'll really appreciate those easy days where things just flow and you're like, this is because I trusted myself and it's just flowing. You have to experience the spectrum in order to appreciate all of it. Yeah. I mean, contrast has been a very big topic that has been coming up for me over the past few weeks. I recently got new carpet in my apartment and I, I rent, so I didn't have a choice about it. 
and the carpet that I had before was like really awful, it's ugly, it didn't feel good on your feet, like just awful. And then the new carpet that I got was more like normal carpet. And for the first two weeks that I had that new carpet, every time I stepped my foot onto it, I was like, oh, this carpet is so soft. This carpet is amazing. Oh my God, I love it so much. And you saw it as just like normal carpet. But it's just the contrast. It's, you know, what you're saying with the highs and the lows. It's like you don't get the highs if you don't know what a low is, right? It's the contrast is what creates our ability to feel good about something else. Like I would not have been a crazy person being euphoric over my new carpet if I didn't have a really terrible carpet before that. It, a normal person would be like, that's normal carpet. I don't feel a high about that, <laughs> you know? The contrast is is very present for me right now, and I'm noticing it in a, a lot of different areas of my life. And because I have been feeling really low, you know, I have these days where I'm like really feeling the lows and really struggling. I mean, this year has still been really hard for me. I mean, it's been a little better than last year, but the first five months, I mean, it's it's still been challenging, and I have these low moments and. There's a part of me that's like, okay, but when something really great happens, when you have this high moment, you're going to appreciate it so much more. You're going to feel the joy so much more because you know the opposite. Yeah. I've been thinking about it a lot too, because I've talked about it on previous podcast episodes and I've talked about it with you, but my pursuit of healing was to feel happiness. When I was 24, that's when my friend died and my lights got turned on and I was like, my life's a disaster. What do I do? And all of a sudden, I just started telling people, I want to be happy when I grow up. My life's about the pursuit of happiness. I'd make people uncomfortable. I'd be at the grocery store and I'd be like, I'm going to be happy for a living. And people would be like, hello, who are you? But I just started like, word vomiting at everybody because I was trying to find the secret to happiness. I was like, everybody else has got it. Where is it? How do I find it? And through the past decade, you know, it's been a driving factor. Like, Why don't I feel happy? Or I get these small moments, but they would be mostly low. And this year, I feel happier than I've ever felt before. And the truth that I've found about happiness is, oh, right, it's just another emotion. It doesn't last forever. It was never meant to last forever. I was never meant to find happiness and keep it like a locket. It's just like my mind has been like, oh, of course. But it was like this idea I didn't understand for about a decade or my whole life. I just thought everybody else was happy. And I'm like, no, there's happy days and there's low days. And there still are. And I have happier days now because I don't judge the low days so much. You know, I used to be like, there's something wrong. Oh, no, I'm back here again. There's something wrong with being here. So then it would keep me there longer because I'd be judging it with wrongness. And now I just feel like I flow more because I'm like, oh, when I'm happy, I'm happy. When I'm low, I'm low. When I'm sad, I'm sad. When I'm mad, I'm mad. But I don't cling. I guess that's what would keep me in this, I'm gripping it. Never leave me, please. And then when I was low, it was like, I will feel this way forever. I was thinking about this morning that I just got back from Mount Rushmore and this thing came up for me while I was there. And I was like, I will never get over this. I will feel this awful forever. Is just what kept playing on my head. I will never forgive myself. I don't know. Three days later, I forgive myself. You know, <laughs> it's just part of it is that's the ego mind coming in, the doubt. I suppress this so deeply because I will never, ever be able to forgive myself. But by allowing it up and finally seeing it, that's all it needed. I always view it as shining light on the darkest corners of ourselves. Like just needed some light. And then it was like, yeah, you're ready to let that go now. Wow. It's just thinking like bringing back full circle about trusting yourself. I think that's been something that I've been learning is that the more I trust myself, the happier I am. My intuition trust is leading me to do things, to go places that feel more, I hate to say the word aligned because I feel like that's, you know, overused vocabulary in the, the coaching world, but like it just for, feels more authentic to me. And I think that so much of our lives, we are following other people. Oh, that person looks happy. Let me go do what they're doing. And I did that for a while. I was okay. I wasn't sad, but I wasn't really happy. And the TV special was the first big thing I had done that was totally just trusting myself. And it's the happiest I have ever been. I mean, it's the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life and the scariest, but I've truly enjoyed every aspect of it. And I didn't really feel that before because I was sort of chasing outcomes or a way to live life or based on what other people are doing. I think social media has 
contributed to our lack of ability to trust ourselves because we're just looking at other people all day, every day, and it disconnects us from our own voice. And it also makes us very reactive. And I think trusting yourself is not really a reactive thing. I mean, unless it's like keeping you safe in a scary situation type thing, but you know, at least for me personally, trusting myself, there's a calmness that I feel not an egoic reactive thing. So becoming happier has been a result of trusting myself more and following what feels good for me and not just what looks like would feel good for somebody else. Yeah, that's a great point because I feel the exact same way that last year I tried to do all these things that other people were doing because I was like, maybe that'll work. Maybe that'll get me more followers. Maybe that'll make me money. I got disconnected from honestly the reason I started New View Advice because I was following everybody else thinking, well, if I get X, then I can do what I want. That was the mentality I had. Once I get this, then I can have what I want. And it wasn't until I gave all that up, which went hand in hand with me removing myself from social media, that happiness was able to sneak its way in and be like, I was here the whole time. I was just waiting for you. And I was like, oh, yeah, there you are. There's things I do love to do. I got disconnected from the things that I love to do because I was doing all the things I should do. It doesn't mean I love every aspect of everything. But it's like you were saying with your TV special, there were hard things, but you loved the process, right? It's same with my podcast. Creating episode show notes isn't my favorite thing to do, but I love the podcast. I love new view advice on what I've created. And another thing that came up for me in Mount Rushmore was that I've had this resistance to new view advice because I don't love to talk about everything I've been through. People might think I do. I don't love it. I don't love to be like, hey, strangers on the internet, here are the worst things that ever happened to me let me tell you. It's uncomfortable. It's not easy. I just don't hear other people outlining what they've actually been through and how they healed from it. So I felt like, well, this is what I always wanted. So I'm willing to do it. And that came up for me in Mount Rushmore because I was reading this quote by Thomas Jefferson. And he said something similar about politics where he was like, I love science, but I just lived in a time where I had to embrace politics because it was just important. And I had this brain switch where I was like, oh yeah, that's how I feel about New View Advice is I just feel a responsibility to help others, but I don't have to love every part of it. And I felt this freedom since it's like I was making myself wrong again. That's one of my things I'm always working on is I was making myself wrong for not loving it. Because I think that you and I have talked about the coaching culture and some of the spirituality culture. And sometimes there's like this mixed message that you're supposed to love everything you do all the time. And I just... I don't think that's the case. I think loving the process and loving parts of it, but you don't have to love like every aspect of it, if that makes sense. Well, where would the growth be if you did? I, when I was in my TV special, I talk about my depression and that wasn't fun for me either. You know, like every time I rehearsed my TV special, I wouldn't rehearse that part. I would skip over it because it's painful for me and I don't want to keep reliving it. And I also didn't want that part to be super rehearsed because it really was coming from my heart, but it was so important for me. Similarly with you, where I was like, it helped me a lot to hear other people talk about it. And I feel like other people that have big followings, you know, talking about it publicly, I feel like that helped save my life. And so I just want to pay that forward. If it could help somebody feel less alone, or save their life in some way, it's 100% worth it. That's why I want to do it. But yeah, I feel like if we loved every single second of every single thing we do, I don't know, there just probably wouldn't be much growth. Yeah. And like what you said, that it can help somebody else. You know, I love the impact I have with New View Advice. And I love when people message me. And it's not even an ego thing, because it's taken me a long time to accept positive feedback. But I love when people are like, oh, you helped me turn the lights on or like, oh, wow, I've never heard anybody talk about it like that before. Thank you so much. You make it so down to earth. I love knowing that my heart led me here. It's like I'm having more of an impact than I realize. It's like, oh, okay, my heart knows something I don't. Because I don't know everybody who listens. I don't, you know, most people don't reach out or anything, which is fine. But if you want to, you can always message me or email me. But it's just nice knowing that my heart is sending me the signs of like, you are making more of a difference than you realize. Because I can be really self-deprecating. So I hope that makes sense. You make such a big difference for me. I'll have one conversation with you and be like, I never thought of it that way. Oh my 
God, you say one sentence and it just alters everything for me. You also do it effortlessly because it's part of who you are. And, you know, I learned that sometimes when we're good at something, we don't notice it because we don't think it's like a big deal because it's easier for us, right? So maybe you don't think it's a huge deal that you say one sentence and it like alters everything for me in such a good way. But I do think it is something that you're just naturally really good at. Like, oh my gosh, like every time I talk to you, it's just like really beneficial. Yeah. Hearing you say that, thank you. It means a lot to me because I'm always like bringing it back to the inner child. And as we're talking about, it, I'm realizing like part of it is that it's hard for me to talk about these things, but it's really validating for my inner child and my inner teenager who, you know, my specifically my family has created a lot of the self-doubt, which I talk about is very common that we hear our parents' voices, but nobody's ever validated my intuition. And I honestly feel like a lot of times I'm able to offer a new view. People tell me problems and I'm able to see it at a different perspective. But growing up, I never had that validated. I was always told I was wrong. Nope, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. So it's been healing for me to have this podcast and to see that I wasn't always wrong, you know, because then I can look back on my childhood and be like, I was right there. Like my gut was right. And nobody in my family will ever validate that for me. They continue to tell me I'm wrong. But back to the self-trust, it's a process of trusting myself. My family has been the ultimate pressure cooker of like, do I trust myself? And through their invalidation, which has been really hard, I have learned to trust myself on a level that I didn't think was possible, you know, but it's taken a really long time and I'm not perfect, but I like to bring in those moments of gratitude for the hard things because they have taught me the most. When I look back, when I was in college, I ended up really being unhappy in the program that I was in. And I decided to transfer schools. And that, there's a lot of judgment around transferring. At least there was back then. And that was a really hard thing. But when I look back, where like maybe I wasn't like as conscious of where it was coming from, but I was, even though it was a judgmental thing, like, oh, transferring. Oh, like kind of, almost like you're giving up at this place. It's like, no, I'm, I'm really unhappy here. And I still want to study graphic design and I want to get a really good education. I'm going to try somewhere else. And it was the best decision I ever made. And I had the best, absolute best design education I could ever have asked for. But again, it, it was just like trusting my gut, trusting myself. And so I've been looking back at those times, like you're saying when you were younger, it's like, oh, okay, so that voice was there. Maybe I didn't know what to call it or label it or how to really look at it. But I think there have been times where I get defiant almost when people are like, no, you're wrong. Something inside me that's defensive almost. You know, I know that I'm right. And I, I don't mean that from an arrogant place, more of just like, I have this feeling and I'm good. I'm trusting it and I'm going with it. Yeah. I love that too, because I think that it can be hard when it comes to self-trust. Like it can come off arrogant. Like, I love that you mentioned there. Like it's not arrogant. Like, I know I can trust myself because I think that it's just another doubt that comes in. Like, wait, am I being arrogant? If I think I'm right here, if everybody else is telling me I'm wrong or like, this is the wrong choice, is this arrogance? You know, like people with good hearts, like don't want to be arrogant. And I think that Part of self-trust is embracing. It's not arrogant. You know what's best for you. Like only you know what's best for you. And I've talked to you about this, but I also think I'm in my villain era. So if I become a little arrogant, like at this point, I'm okay with it. I'll swing back to the middle. Like, I don't know. Like, that's how I feel. I've been such a people pleaser for so long. I'm just like, like enough. I know what my heart's saying. I don't always want to follow it. I'm going to do it anyway because it's become actually painful not to. I get so angry when I don't follow it. That's how my intuition speaks to me. It speaks to me like so often through anger that I'm like, all right, whatever. Here we go. Here we go. If I'm the villain, it's fine. Do you think though that the villain using that word, it's like you're judging yourself for what you're feeling or what you're doing? It's actually funny. I actually think of the Batman quote from Dark Knight where there's a quote in the movie where Harvey Dent, who's the mayor, <laughs> I just, I'm laughing because like this is such an Evan thing. And I'm like, does my audience watch the Dark Knight? Like, I don't know. But there's this quote where you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And Thomas Jefferson, to bring up Mount Rushmore again, had a similar quote that he said, basically, I'm butchering all of Thomas Jefferson's quotes, by the way, but he said, basically, like, he wasn't naive to think that he would have the same reputation when he left office as when he took office. And for me, embracing my villain within is embracing that not everybody's going to like me and I'm going to be the villain in people's stories. And for so long, all I've wanted is for people to like me. And that was like my inner teenager, a lot of trauma. Also, who doesn't want people to like them? It's just human. 
I've always wanted to feel accepted and I've always wanted to feel like I belong. And those are things I've really struggled with. And being the nice girl hasn't gotten me where I want to go. So if I'm a villain in other people's stories in order to tell mine, then so be it. Because for me, especially with my memoir, like as I write it, it's like, yeah, this is snarky. And yeah, I have a lot of shit to say. The arrogant part of me is like, well, you shouldn't have done it if you didn't want me to write about it. But the truth of me writing it is that Amanda deserves to have a voice. And this is my truth. Everybody's welcome to write their own memoir. For a long time, I've felt like a coward. It's like this deep, deep fear I didn't even know was there for a really long time. It came up this year where it was like, yeah, just like this deep, like I'm a coward because of, I mean, for me, it went back to I didn't report who sexually assaulted me. And so I've held on to a lot of guilt regarding the other people who likely experienced what I experienced. And I've held on to, you know, like it's my fault. And I would never tell any other survivor that that was their burden to carry. You got to get there yourself, right? And for me, I recently did get there. But part of it's being the villain that this is, this is how I get justice. This is how I tell my story. Nobody was ever going to believe me in a court of law. Like, I know that. So this is my version of justice. I just had a thought about that because I was thinking how it relates to my story being kidnapped and the, the villain idea, part of something that I have struggled with that I worked through in therapy is, you know, I was kidnapped on a date and it was a really terrifying experience. And when I went to therapy to talk about it, I was concerned about the person who kidnapped me. And I was like, maybe they're bipolar. Maybe they're working through something. I just kept trying to figure out like, why they did this. And the therapist was like, we're here to talk about you and work through your feelings, <laughs> you know? And so like, I'm almost wondering if it's like, this idea of, like, oh, I'm just going to be the villain in someone else's life. Maybe it's like, there were these villains in our lives and we gave them way too much. You know, it's like, are we villains now for making them out to be the bad guys, essentially? Or are we villains for finally sticking up for ourselves or voicing our opinions? I totally understand with the memoir, there are people in your life that might read things that you've written about them that, you know, that they might not like. But I don't know. But the more I think about this villain word, the more I'm wondering about the judgment and like, how you know, how that looks from other angles. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I definitely don't see myself the way I think other people see me. It's really hard what I do. I talk about things I'm not supposed to talk about. I get backlash. Like I get comments from my mother. I feel it. And I have so much self-doubt before I record the episodes. And it's hard to know that I've worked so hard to not hurt other people. And that the only way forward is to hurt people. So that's what feels villain-esque. I'm still grappling with, am I a villain? Because like, there are certain situations where like, I'll go fall into people pleasing and Evan will be like, I thought you were in your villain era. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love that. But yeah, but it's like, like you talk about the pendulum swinging the other way. It's like protecting these other people for so long that you lose yourself. You know, that's like what I was doing. You know, what I, I shouldn't even say in past tense, I still tend to do it and I'm more self-aware and working on it, you know, but it's like being so concerned about people that have hurt me or something. Even with my therapist, when I was talking about the guy who said the really awful things about my TV special and she was like, that's a troll. Like, that's just a troll. And I'm like, well, let's talk about the psychology that got him there. But it's to my detriment. I'm missing opportunities to work through my own shit when I'm so concerned about others. Yeah. I love that you were, use that word protection too, because that was a message that kept coming up for me in Mount Rushmore was if Amanda's worried about protecting everybody else, who's protecting Amanda? And that's like one of the deep wounds of my life is feeling like nobody protected me. And of course, protection comes from within, yada, yada, but not when you're a kid. <laughs> like, no, that's actually the responsibility of adults. You know, so many people don't want to be adults because they don't want to take on responsibility. But if you have children, things shift and change. But at the end of the day, it's not my responsibility to protect others and I should have been protected. And even with you were saying it, talking about in therapy, one of the hardest things for me to work through it revolving being raped in my teens was that there were bystanders. So there were people who watched it and didn't do anything. And I remember bringing it to my therapist. I actually had an opposite experience where she was like, oh, witnessing it can also be a trauma. Where in that moment, I needed her to validate me. And in that moment, I felt like she put on me the bystanders. Because I had come in there being like, that's kind of fucked up, right? Question mark. And she went the opposite way where she was like, well, that's really traumatic. And so it took me longer to work through it. Yeah. Wow. 
I had to come to my own validation again. That's often my story is, like, you know, like again, grateful for the therapist who said that so that I could really validate myself. But yeah, it's just all so complicated, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, see, you're like, oh, I know I have to validate the therapist. And that's one thing that's so annoying about being self-aware and wanting to work on yourself all the time, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, okay, well, I got to thank the therapist for creating that opportunity for me to look at it differently for myself, you know? I mean, it's like, okay, well, I got to thank my high school theater teacher who made me feel like I wasn't good enough to be a star or whatever. And because now I just film my own TV special. Yeah. And bringing up the therapist reminds me that's another reason I've been labeling myself the villain is because I talk a lot about how broken the systems are in my book. And again, people aren't going to like that. And I'm a big proponent of therapy. I was in it for a decade and there are a lot of positives, but it's not perfect. It's not perfect at all. I've had a lot of experiences that set me back with things like what I just shared. And that's like a light example from what Amanda's received from professionals. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's interesting. I'm like, no to all listeners. You are allowed to interview your therapist. You are allowed to ask questions and you are allowed to leave at any point you are uncomfortable. <laughs> it goes back to self-trust though. The reason I want to bring some of this to light is because I gave my trust away too easily to professionals because I was so desperate for someone to fix me because I was so broken. I was like, this person has to have the answers. If they don't, I don't know if I'll survive the month. And that's why, again, I feel like responsibility to speak up on some of these things that were inappropriate because it's so hard to find a therapist. You have to go through this intake process. I just tried to find a therapist again. I got new insurance and it was such a broken system that I just left there and I was just like, enough. I'm going to find a solution for this. Like, I'm going to be part of the solution because like, enough. I couldn't believe the place I was and that they thought that place was good for people's mental health. And I was angry. I was so angry when I left. And it's because I'm in a good place now that I could see it all so clearly. Anyway, I have a lot of feelings about the systems. I mean, yeah, I didn't have anything nearly as bad, but one time when I was trying to get a new therapist in network, <laughs> you know, because it's got to be in network for health insurance reasons, I very quickly felt it wasn't a good match. And I was kind of telling her that I know how it sounds, but like she wasn't letting me, she's like, no, no, you have to go through three sessions, at least three sessions. And I'm like, I already know we are not a good match at all. And saying out loud, she made me go to these three sections. I'm an adult. <laughs> like I could have been like, no, sorry, I'm leaving. Goodbye. And by the third session, she was like, oh yeah, you're right. This isn't a good match. I'm like, yeah, no shit lady. But, but you know, the thing that you say too, about looking to experts. Yeah. I mean, I talk about that in my book, but it's, I go through that with pursuing my dreams and, and I ask an expert for advice or for steps I should take. And then they, sometimes they give me wonderful advice. that's super helpful. And then sometimes they tell me something where I'm like, that doesn't feel good. And I understand you're an expert, but that doesn't feel right for me. You know, like I, I talked to an expert in the industry who said that like, if I want to make a TV special off of my book, I should essentially give the rights away, like let someone else do it and walk away. And I was like, no, I want to be involved. I, I didn't know exactly what the show was going to be, but I was like, I want to be involved, you know? So sometimes we place too much dependence upon experts to tell us what to do. And we use that as another reason not to trust ourselves. Yes, 100%. I think the experts is a huge thing. A, a reason like creates more self-doubt and things like that. I know I've come across that a lot of times. And what I see now looking back is that like, a lot of times with experts, it goes back to that intention I talked about earlier. I looked at certain people and I was like, that person's happy. They're going to show me how to become happy. And I look back now and I'm like, I don't know what their intention for their life was. I don't know if they are happy. I was following somebody because I perceived something about them, not because of who they actually are, but my vision was clouded because of what I wanted and I wanted somebody else to fix me. You know, that's so much a part of my memoir is just that it's all the times I put my power outside of myself. All the times I was like, this person can fix me. This can fix me. This will fix me. This will fix me. And then in the end, it's just like, ah, it was me the whole time. I'm who doesn't even fix me. I don't even think it's fixing. You know, now it's like, oh, it's never was about fixing me. It was just about remembering there was nothing ever wrong with me. But for so long, I felt so broken. I thought I had to be fixed. So I kept looking outside myself. And yeah, when it comes to trust, you know, I like to talk about how trust is built over time and it's same with ourselves. We build that trust over time. So like, through my memoir, it's like a journey of me building that self-trust over time. It didn't happen overnight. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's such a good point. And I, I almost wonder too, it's like the longer we've been an adult and the longer we've had the world thrown at us from different directions, different experts, different social media. It's like the longer we've been an adult, the, the more time we have had to not trust ourselves. Like, it's like something I say in Hollywood where I'm like, the longer you've been in an industry, the more limiting beliefs you have because you think you know how everything works. Oh, you can't do it that way. That's not how it works. This is how it works. It's like when you're in an industry for a long time, you know how everything works. And while that's good in some ways, that can be really limiting to you in terms of thinking outside the box and, you know, doing things that are possible. And I think it's, it's similar with this. It's like the longer you've had the world show you reasons of why you shouldn't trust yourself, the less you trust yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to bring that back to the 20 year olds that I mentioned earlier. It's like when we're growing up, like one through 18 for most people, you know, you have to trust your parents. You have to like follow the rules. And then when you leave the home or you go to university or college, it's your first chance to begin trusting yourself. So you're not supposed to know what you're doing at, you know, 18, 22, even 25. I'm 32. I still don't know what I'm doing. It just gets easier. But you're not supposed to know how to trust yourself immediately if you haven't had practice, if you didn't have parents who helped you do that. And most of us don't have parents who are, like, you know, talking us through how to trust ourselves. If there's rules, you follow them, you follow the school rules. And then when you become an adult, people think they're just supposed to like, know what to do. And it's like, no, it's a new chapter. It will happen over time. There's no rush. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, that, that's like the big myth of life. It's like when I get to be this age, I will have life figured out. <laughs> It's never, it's never that way. It's more about you and the journey than the outside stuff, you know? Totally. I mean, in my TV special, I say, you know, is how it's about a journey. I was like, you're following your dreams. It's about who you become along the way. This TV special has been such an eye-opening experience for me because there are some big dreams that I've had that I had 15 years ago that haven't quote unquote manifested yet. Getting to this TV special, it's like, oh, I can now see why. I can now see why. Like, I get it. And that process to get here was so important. Yeah, learning to trust yourself is really like understanding that you mentioned at the beginning. It might not be logical right now, but everything really is just a part of the journey. And, you know, when I look back on my life, my biggest regret is always, I just wish I was kinder to myself along the journey. Like, I wish I had just relaxed a little bit understood self-trust and been kinder to myself. That's always my biggest regret is like, oh, I look back there and it's like, yeah, if I had been kinder to myself, that would have been a little easier. It was always going to be hard, but if I had been nice to myself, it would have been easier. It's like what I said to you the other day when I was like, yeah, I'm going through the most painful emotional experience I have ever been through. And then I was like, oh, but I guess it's also the most transformative. God damn it. <laughs> like, oh, they come hand in hand. Like, darn. Yeah. And that's the highs and the lows again that we talked about, right? Like painful stuff often is the most transformative, which leads to those happy, joy, content, peace, those feelings. Well, oftentimes, it's our own inner stuff that's keeping us from those feelings. But also life comes and goes. But along the way, when I'm judging myself as wrong the whole time, I'm keeping myself from any sort of peace or contentment or happiness because I'm judging myself. And so I'll always feel even worse along the way. And it's like you said earlier, trust to me feels the same, that it's like a calmness. So anytime I'm doubting myself, I don't feel that same sense of calmness. And that trust helps me to feel calm, which then helps me to feel other things. See, like because society has taught us not to trust ourselves in that way, it's like I feel the sense of calmness. And then I'm like, well, I don't know. Should I trust that calmness? I don't know. I'm taught not to trust that. Like, maybe I should be ready for something bad. It's a constant battle. Before we wrap this episode up, do you have any other thoughts on trust or anything you'd like to leave everybody with? So one, one sort of visual metaphor I give actually that I wrote in my next special is have you ever been in public and somebody is taking a call on speakerphone or you are on the subway and someone's like on a FaceTime call? Like for me, it's been happening sometimes in the sauna at the gym, which drives me nuts. Like the sauna, I'll be like meditating in this quiet, beautiful, tiny sauna and someone will walk in on a freaking FaceTime call. And I think that a lot of us walk through life that way because when I'm in the sauna and I'm trying to meditate and someone walks in on a FaceTime call or blasting their music, suddenly I can't hear myself anymore. And all I can hear is 
their conversation and what they're doing. And I think that a lot of us walk through life that way so much that we've almost trained ourselves not to listen to our own voice. So I guess if I were to, you know, say anything in closing, I would just encourage you to get quiet, whatever that means for you. It doesn't have to be meditating. It could be just sitting out in nature. It could be sitting in your living room, but just tuning out the noise for a second and trying to tune into your own voice Because for me, I've been like, oh, that's what I really think about this. Or, oh, that's how, you know, it's like you don't even realize. And I think that when you're able to tune out all that outside noise and connect to yourself, it will lead you down a path of fulfillment. It'll be scary and risky and you'll have all the doubts that we've talked about today. But I do think that when you start following your own desires and your own thoughts, it will lead you to fulfillment in a way that you never would have experienced following somebody else's voice. Love that. I love that example of the FaceTime. I think that's such a great visual for that. It drives me bonkers, but it is. It's, you know, I, I remember once listening to a podcast and I heard a woman say that she was so busy all the time. And sometimes busyness is a way to mask anything that's going on internally, right? Because like you don't even take a moment to stop and breathe and to look inward at all. And it wasn't until she paused and like stopped the busyness for a second, you know? And so I, I think about that a lot. There is a lot to be said about taking a moment of quietude for yourself to tune back in. And I think, you know, the more you do that, the more you don't have to go sit in nature to be able to hear it. You know, you can hear it anywhere, anytime, any day, but to start sort of training yourself to, to listen to yourself. Yeah. I talk about self-care all the time on the podcast and I feel like people are like, oh my God, this girl's talking about self-care again. But it's exactly what you're saying. It's that everybody's lives are so busy. And what I find in my one-on-one sessions is that everybody's running from themselves. You know, they're like, I can't make a minute. Let's let's take it now. And then usually tears will come up or it's something that people have been running from, myself included. I do this too. It's, yeah, it's finding those small moments. And again, I like how you said like you can do it anywhere because I think that's a big part of it is I think so many times people then add it as a to-do. So then their busy lives become busier because it's like, I got to take 15 minutes to meditate. I got to, you know, find my pillow. I got to get my journal. And it's, you know, just take a breath right here, right now. You know, after this episode, just pause it for like 60 seconds. You don't have to time it. You know what I mean? I'm like, just give me an example. You don't have to set your timer. Like, just take. Right. There's no structure that is required to listen to yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And just slow down. Other people always say too, like, I can't hear my intuition. It's in the quiet and in the slow, you know, that's where you can hear it. Yeah. Because some people tune it out on purpose. It's like what you're saying. And the busyness thing, sometimes I'll see people and I'm not judging, but I, like sometimes I'll see people that are so busy, like every second of their day is planned or they're just constantly doing things where they are surrounded by other people. And sometimes you can kind of see like you're hiding from something. And, and I can say that from experience. <laughs> Me too. Me too. It's from experience. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's not from judgment. It's from experience. <laughs> I've done that shit too. I still do. You know? And it's like, what are you running from? Because the more busy you are, the less time you have a second to look inward and to experience whatever you're feeling. Like sometimes you don't even realize that you're feeling a certain emotion until something triggers it. Yeah. Yes. Yes to all that. So we invite you to slow down today. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's a good way to end this episode. So I just want to thank you for coming on New View Advice and for being a wonderful guest as always. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Seriously. You you bring so much value through this podcast. I know you talked about getting compliments, but I'm just going to keep throwing it at you so that you hear it more. You, you bring so much value through this podcast. And I just think what a blessing that you decided to follow your own voice that led you to do this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to, I'm just going to accept that. Perfect. There's like all these thoughts and it's like, just accept the compliment, Amanda. Thank Thank you. you. And move on. (laughs) And I also just want to say, I love your work. And I always tell you that I think it's so important that you challenge people in the way they view the world and that you inspire people by telling them that they can pursue their biggest dreams because those are the messages of our hearts, right? If you're like, I can't hear my intuition, but you have a dream. That is your intuition. You know what I mean? It's yes. So. Yep. Last line of my TV special, when your heart speaks, listen. (sighs) What a beautiful way to end.
Thanks again for joining us for today's episode. If you haven't already, I invite you to follow the podcast so you never miss an episode and to leave a five-star rating and a review of the episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd love to hear from you. And thanks again for joining us today. And I hope we were able to offer you a new view on whatever you may be going through. Sending you all my love. See you next time.